and uh, you know we have to have three twenty. Um, Alan is a emeritus professor in uh, the Faculty of Health Sciences in the Department of Medicine. Um, he's held many positions across both McMaster and different institutions. He was at some point the acting chair of a department of neurosciences at McMaster, which closed and became the Department of Biomedical Sciences. Um, he's written a number of uh, interesting books, and I'm reading his, his most recent book on that is the basis of this talk. And he has this wonderful way, which I think he's going to do in this talk, of weaving the history of people uh, with the history of science and give science a real human face. So I hope uh, we're going to have a very interesting and engaging talk. Uh, please welcome Alan Comet. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much, David, and the organizing committee for inviting me. I would like to tell you a story. And the point of the story, which we'll come to at the end, is to try and persuade you that we're getting closer to understanding what the brain mechanisms may be underlying consciousness. And that memory, short-term memory, or working memory, may actually be the generator of consciousness. Now we have quite a way to go, and the story has good people, heroes, other people not quite so good, either through arrogance or ignorance, did not do well, and there's even one literary assassin. So, the story begins, as I tell it to you, um, in 1969. That was the year that the Americans landed on the moon, so it's memorable for that reason. But if you were a neurosurgeon, it was a good time, especially if you were a stereotactic neurosurgeon. Because the neurosurgeons had come up with a rather ingenious operation which treated patients with Parkinsonism. Now, one of the problems with Parkinsonism is the tremor of the hands. And quite by accident, Irvin Cooper, a neurosurgeon at St. Barnabas Hospital in New York, discovered that by making a very small lesion in the thalamus, he could abolish the tremor. And that was really big news, actually, because it enabled the Parkinsonian patient to actually bring a cup to the mouth and do all sorts of other things with the hands. And Cooper went further. On the right, you see a cooling probe which he designed, which was based on the expansion of liquid nitrogen at the tip. So you could first of all reversibly block function in the thalamus, and then you could make a permanent lesion. Now there's one problem in all of this, and that was that heads differ. They differ in size and in shape, and that means that the structures in the brain may also differ a bit. Now remember that I'm talking about a time before MRI machines and CT scanners. And the localization of the lesion was very, very important because if it wasn't right, it could do serious damage. So the neurosurgeons came for help to the neurophysiologists. And I was one. I was in the north of England in Newcastle upon Tyne and we would make recordings from the human thalamus. The electrodes were made out of stiff tungsten wire, sharpened at the tip, and the electrode would come in from the back into the thalamus through the pulvinar, and then we would wait and see if we could identify cells which would fire impulses when we either touched the skin of the opposite side of the body, or bent joints. And you see two neurons here. Uh, this one is responding to pressure above the lip, and the other one is responding to straightening of the index finger. Now, once we saw that type of response, we knew that we were in the VPM nucleus, the ventralis post-promediatus. 
and the neurosurgeon just had to go two millimeters forwards into the ventralis lateralis and make his lesion, and the tremor was gone. Well, we were doing that very happily in 1969. Now we jump forward two years, and things have changed. Um, first of all, I have the privilege of now being at McMaster, and I came with my friend, Dr. Adrian Upton. I'm sorry, there is? That's my fault. The surname is Upton. I've just seen that it's actually missing. But that's Adrian. Um, Adrian did a lot of work with Cooper, the neurosurgeon I mentioned, on deep brain stimulation. In fact, they were the first people in the world to do it. Unfortunately, there were no neurosurgeons who were operating on Parkinsonian patients, so I had to stop that work. And also, there was a new medical treatment, L-DOPA, which was proving very effective. Now, the prevailing view of consciousness at that time, a view which was shared not only by the general public, but also by neuroscientists, and I think psychologists, was that only human beings were conscious. And they were conscious because they had these big heads with the development of the cerebral hemispheres and particularly the prefrontal cortex. The person who had the courage to disagree with this was Wilder Penfield. Uh, hands up, those of you who have heard of Wilder Penfield. Oh, very good, all right. Um, he was a very famous man in Canada. He was a neurosurgeon. After he died, there was a postage stamp in his honor and also a street in Montreal. Penfield was famous. He was famous because he would stimulate the exposed cortex of his patients and see what sort of sensations he could evoke. And he noticed, he couldn't help noticing, that it was quite possible to remove big chunks of brain, especially in the prefrontal area, with very little consequence for the patient. You might not know that an operation had been done, and I've seen this for myself. In contrast to that, either through trauma or infection or hemorrhage or surgery, if there was damage to the brain stem, the results could be devastating. There would be loss of consciousness from which the patient might not recover. And Penfield developed this centroencephalic hypothesis. He said that the cortex was very important. It was collecting information about the environment, but that information was brought to the brain stem, and there it was integrated and consciousness somehow developed. So the seat of consciousness was in the brain stem. Well, um, just to remind you what else Penfield did, he mapped out the motor cortex and the sensory cortex. Uh, sensory cortex here, motor cortex there. But unfortunately, in 1957, uh, something happened. In an article in Brain, the leading neurological journal, this man, Francis Walsh, a leading neurologist in England, really took Penfield apart because of his centrencephalic uh, thesis. And um, Walsh, in a way, um, he, first of all, he never gave Penfield any warning, which was, I think, a mistake. It was not a dignified way of proceeding. But he also misquoted Penfield. And he never really dealt with the arguments that Penfield had given for supposing that consciousness arose in the brain stem. But Walsh was very influential, and he wrote beautifully, and he ridiculed Penfield uh, right down to the very last word in his article. And that really put paid to the centroencephalic hypothesis. So once again, everyone was thinking about consciousness being the cerebral hemispheres, particularly towards the front. All right. Now, in the work that I... Um, is talking about the work on the thalamus. We did make recordings, as you saw, and there were three observations which I felt were important. The first was that it didn't really matter which part of the brain you were in. 
there's so much spontaneous activity going on. Not only that, but no matter what you ask the patient to do, and the patient was fully conscious, no matter what you ask the patient to do, it didn't seem to make any difference to the activity. So that was the first thing. The second point was that the, the messages that we were getting about touch and pressure and the bending of joints, the messages we were detecting in the thalamus were just the same as the sort of messages that we would have picked up in the nerves, the peripheral nerve fibers coming from the receptors. And this meant that the important thing in the sensory pathway was not so much modifying uh, the message, but simply getting the message up to the cortex where it could then be worked upon. The third observation was one that I've touched on before. We would ask the patient to concentrate on the finger that was being stimulated or the part of the face, or we would try to distract them by getting them to do mental arithmetic or read, and it didn't make any difference whatsoever. And this is very disappointing, because those of you who know your neuroanatomy will know that there are very powerful projections coming down from the somatosensory cortex to each stage in the ascending pathway. Thalamus, dorsal column nuclei, and dorsal horn with the spinal cord. And it was thought that these, these pathways must be there to be able to cut off the message if it was necessary for the brain to concentrate on something else. It's just not true. And there is a message there. Um, the brain not may work as you think it might. All right. So we've dealt with Penfield and Francis Walsh. In 1975, something rather interesting happened. Francis Crick decided that he was going to study consciousness. Now, you all remember uh, Watson and Crick, who came up with the double helical structure for DNA. That was back in 1953. They got the Nobel Prize for it. And Crick remained on top of molecular biology for the next 20 years. And then, clever man that he was, he announced publicly that he was going to work out what consciousness was, how it was generated. And instead of James Watson, he had another young man, Christoph Koch, to help him in this. Now, let me ask you, how many of you have seen the recent film Oppenheimer? Good. I think you'll agree it was a very good film. Early in the film, Niels Bohr, perhaps the leading quantum uh, physicist of the time, was visiting Cambridge. And Oppenheimer was a graduate student there, and he went to Bohr's lecture. And Bohr said to him, you were at my lecture, you asked a good question. But he said, it's one thing to be able to read the notes, but can you hear the music? And that's something that I think we have to bear in mind. We can read textbooks, or as clinicians, we can examine patients, but do we really get a sense of what is really going on? And Crick was rather arrogant. Um, he was not even prepared to read the music, and he certainly didn't hear it. And one of the things that he and Christoph Koch did was to deliberately discard, reject, anything that had been done on consciousness before 1975. And that was unfortunate, because that included a very important symposium on brain mechanisms and consciousness, which was held in Canada in 1953 in the Laurentians. And I'll just point out a few of the famous names. Uh, here is Lord Adrian the most famous neurophysiologist of his time. Here is Wilder Penfield with his bow tie. His very close colleague, Herbert Jasper, who actually organized the meeting. And here is Magoon, and at the back, Maruzzi. And I'm going to mention them very briefly at the end of the lecture, because Magoon and Maruzzi had discovered the reticular activating system a part of the hindbrain, a part of the brain stem, which when stimulated, 
could convert the electrical, electrical activity from a sleeping pattern to an awake pattern. All right. Crick decided that he would concentrate on the visual system because more was known about that system than any of the other uh, sensory systems. And his technique was to look at the neural circuitry, which had been worked out by other people, and to try and decide at which stage, in which part of the brain, <laughs> consciousness might arise. Well, if you look at that, that's a very complex circuitry indeed. And it was really doomed to failure. And worse, he ended up by saying that vision actually entered consciousness in the prefrontal cortex. He hadn't heard the music, he hadn't read the notes. If he had, he would have known that in the 1940s and 50s, there was a very popular operation for patients who were depressed called um, prefrontal leucotomy. And it was done by inserting a wire blade uh, through the back of the eye, and then, I'm sorry, I don't know what to put you off, <laughs> rotating it and actually severing all the neurons at the front of the brain from those at the remainder. And the results were sometimes uh, quite good. Um, patients did improve. Um, but one thing they did not have was any blindness. They could see perfectly well. And if Crick had taken the trouble to actually read some of the literature, he would have realized that. Um, all right. What Crick did do was to show the consciousness, understanding consciousness, really meant being able to answer two questions. One of them is question number two there, the hard problem. How on earth is it that electrical in impulses in neurons can be converted into a feeling, a sensation, a will, a memory? How on earth can this happen? And we don't have any idea at all. It may be, in fact, unanswerable. But the first question, where in the brain is theoretically a soluble one. Is it the whole brain which is responsible for consciousness or are some parts more important than others? Um, and uh, Crick referred to this as the neural correlates of consciousness. Now while Crick was looking at the neural circuitry, someone else was doing a very important experiment. And I think it's one of the most important experiments ever in psychology. The person was Benjamin Libet. Here he is. And his, ex his experiment was based on the readiness potential. Um, how many of you know of the readiness potential? Oh, well, I'm very impressed, actually. Um, anyway, it's a negativity, a negative potential, which can be recorded from the scalp over the top of the head um, when a patient uh, sorry, when a subject is carrying out a motor task. And the task which was originally used was simply tapping whenever the subject felt like doing it. And um, Kornhuber and Dieker, the Germans who described this, found that there was a negative potential which was detected before the movement actually took place. This was the readiness potential. Well, Eccles, the famous Sir John Eccles, said, well, this potential obviously has to do with the will. This is the neural circuitry that's um, carrying out the will to make the movement. Libet wasn't so sure. And he modified the experiment so that the subjects looked at a cathode ray oscilloscope tube, and they had to watch a spot which was circling around like this, and they had to notice at what point the spot had reached when they, be, when they became aware of the intention to move. And the surprising thing was that the negative potential started about 250 milliseconds, a quarter of a second, 
before the subject became aware of the will, of the intention to make the movement. And that really is a big challenge for the concept of free will. Free will is something that's already being generated by the neurons. It's not the will which is activating the neurons in some mysterious way. Well, a very, very important experiment. Now, um, the next step in the story was a symposium which was held on this campus and which involved this department very heavily, especially um, uh, Bruce Milliken, who was chair, and Sue Becker. And it, it was a successful symposium, but it really got me thinking. And I've always thought that, you know, there are so many observations about the brain from neuroscientists and psychologists and clinicians and so on, that the information must be out there that's needed um, to define what consciousness actually is. So it, rather than using a, a top-down approach like Crick, I thought it might be better to do a, a bottom-up approach. So we start off with Charles Darwin. Now Darwin had no doubt whatsoever that animals were conscious. He would see them playing with, with each other. He could see that they were acting as if they had emotions. Some of them could carry out um, very complex behaviors which were suggestive of consciousness. And for Darwin, the critical question was not whether animals were conscious, but at what stage in evolution did consciousness appear? And it's a very good question, actually, because I think we would probably accept that monkeys and chimpanzees and elephants and crows, because of their intelligent behavior, uh, are most likely to be conscious. But what about when you get down to the level of insects? I'm sure you all know the story about the honeybees, that a foraging honeybee can find a source of nectar, fly back to the hive, and by doing a dance, indicate, first of all, in which direction the bees should fly for the nectar and how far they have to go. Um, is that a form of consciousness? And what about this assassin bug? This is a very clever creature, actually. It feeds on termites, and it goes up to the termite mound, and the first thing it does is coat itself with mud and dust from the mound so that it smells like a termite rather than of an invader. Then it kills one termite, bites the head off, sucks out the inside, and uses that dead exoskeleton as bait for another live termite. It actually, as it were, goes fishing. It puts the dead skeleton in the opening to the termite mound. And the live termites, of course, like to dispose of any dead brethren. So a live termite grabs hold of the dead one, the assassin bug pulls it out and eats it, and then does the same thing over and over again. Well, that's quite complex behavior. And an assassin bug has about a million neurons, which is a very big number indeed. So we don't know the answer. We will never know the answer. But it's certainly worth thinking about. All right. Now, memory. What evolutionary advantage was there in memory? Well, you needed memory, um, obviously, if you were going to eat the right sort of food and avoid your predators and knew where to go. Um, so to have memory implies that you have consciousness. I don't see that you can have memory without consciousness. The big question regarding memory was whether the memory was disseminated, whether different parts of a memory were in different parts of the brain, or whether there was one part of the brain where all the memories uh, were stored. And people were pretty well split 50-50 either way. Um, Crick himself believed, for example, that if I were to look at one of you now, 
um, different parts of my brain would be responsible for where you were in my visual field, uh, what colors you were wearing with your clothing, um, your size, whether or not you were moving. And that um, the memory would then be recalled by linking electrical activity in these different parts of the brain. Um, and there was a 40 hertz uh, rhythm which was incriminated. Now the opposite approach was that the memories were intact, as it were, they weren't broken up, and they were stored in special cells. And one of the people who believed that was William James, the first American experimental psychologist. And he talked about pontifical cells storing memories. All right. Well, it turns out that William James and those who followed him, uh, like Jerzy Konowski and um, uh, the people who believed in grandmother cells, that they were right. And the brain structure, which is so important for memory, we know now, is the hippocampus. And here you see the hippocampus and the floor of the lateral ventricle, there's its head, and then the fimbria will go there. And here it is again with the fimbria, and it's all part of the limbic system. And the person who showed that the hippocampus was very important for memory was a Canadian, Brenda Milner. And believe it or not, Brenda Milner is 104 years old, and she still goes into work every day. And in the 1950s, she was introduced to a young man, patient H.M., as we now know, Henry Moliason, who had had both hippocampi operated on for intractable seizures. Penfield um, would take out part of one temporal lobe for seizures, but this surgeon uh, operated on both hippocampi. This was for the very first time. And remarkably, it was found that HM could only remember for 30 seconds. He had a short-term memory of 30 seconds. Some years later, there's an Englishman, a musicologist, Clive Waring. Have any of you heard of Clive or? Good. Uh, and did you see a video of him? Yes. Um, Clive wasn't operated on. He had the misfortune to develop a viral infection of his brain, herpes simplex encephalitis. And for some reason, the hippocampus is a favorite target for the virus. So on both sides, the hippocampi were almost totally destroyed. And this very intelligent man uh, was left with a memory of about seven seconds. So he is alert. But every seven seconds or so, he will say, where am I? I've never been conscious before. I don't know where I am. I don't know who you are. I don't know who brought me here. I've never seen a doctor in my life. And sometimes he would write it down in a notebook that he kept by his bedside. And then after a few more seconds, he would say exactly the same thing again. Where am I? I've never been conscious before. Never been conscious before. So this really, really incriminated the hippocampus. So what we have now is some soft evidence, soft evidence linking the hippocampus to consciousness. We mentioned evolution. How can you have memory without being conscious? Um, we've seen uh, Clive Waring and uh, patient HM. There's a third reason for linking the hippocampus to consciousness, and that is patients who have psychomotor or temporal lobe epilepsy. They may have automatisms. They may uh, sort of walk, even talk, um, carry out movements, normal movements with the hands, but be totally unaware of what they are doing. And the most dramatic case was someone that the English neurologist Hunings Jackson reported. This is a doctor, a doctor in London, England. 
a doctor who saw the patient, took a history, examined the patient, wrote out a prescription, and then afterwards had absolutely no recollection of doing any of this, even the writing. And in such patients, there is very often a tumour in the vicinity of the hippocampus. So there are all these pointers then towards a linkage between the hippocampus and consciousness. But it's soft evidence. But now we actually have some hard evidence. And this is to do with concept cells. These were actually reported first uh, in 2005. And they made quite an impact to begin with, but now people seem to have forgotten about them. And they're hardly ever mentioned in relation to consciousness. The person who is doing the work, who is spearheading the work at the moment, is Rodrigo Quiroga. And originally he was in Los Angeles, but he's now at the University of Barcelona. And what he and other people did in Los Angeles was to take patients who were being considered for surgery for their seizures. <clears throat> and the important thing was to find out where in the temporal lobe the abnormal impulse activity for the seizure was originating. So um, a Dr. Freed, one of the authors there, um, would record from his patients, and he used um, an electrode, polythene tube, with large surfaces here for recording activities from populations of neurons. But inside the polythene tube, there were half a dozen very fine wires which acted as individual electrodes. And a recording from one such wire is shown here. Each of these spikes is an impulse from a neuron. And what they found was something very, very surprising. Uh, one of their first subjects to do this was a great fan of films and of the actress Jennifer Aniston in particular. And sure enough, the electrode recorded uh, the activity of such a cell. And the important thing was that it didn't matter um, which way Jennifer Aniston was looking, whether to the side or straight ahead, whether she was smiling, whether she was showing her teeth or not, whether she had short hair or long hair, what clothes she was wearing, the cell always fired in response to Jennifer Aniston. And for a while, these were called Jennifer Aniston neurons. Well, you don't have to be a film actress to have concept cells dedicated to you. Um, you can be a building or an object, even an equation. And this is um, another recording. There's a lot on this slide, and I'll take you through it. First of all, at the top, you see the impulse activity recorded by one wire electrode. And you can see just from the different heights of the impulses that there are a number of cells which are firing away spontaneously. Rodrigo Quiroga, who I showed you, was the software engineer who devised a decomposition program, a software program, which could sort out the different spikes, partly on the basis of shape and partly on the basis of amplitude. And here, from this group recording, you see the superimposed responses of six, sorry, five neurons, all right? Now, uh, we're just going to consider the responses of two of these, neuron three and neuron five. So first of all, uh, neuron three, that's right across here. Neuron three responds to this absolute villain, <laughs> Vladimir Putin. It doesn't respond to any of the other stimuli. These are rasters, actually. Um, the subject was able, were told to look at the screen, and the image was changed every second. 
So this is one second of activity. Every blue dot is an impulse. This is the first and this is the, the end of the series. And you can see on every occasion the neuron responded to an image of Vladimir Putin. It didn't respond to any of the other presentations. Cluster 5, neuron 5, was quiet. It wasn't firing spontaneously, but it did respond to pictures of the Taj Mahal, specifically. And very remarkably, these cells, they don't only respond to pictures, they respond to the word, the spoken word or the written word. It is the concept, a visual, auditory, so on, which is being coded for um, by the hippocampus. All right. Now, it's all very well showing these cells, but what is their relationship to consciousness? Uh, is there hard evidence we can get by working with these cells? And the answer is yes, there is. One sort of experiment is face morphing. You take two faces, in this case Bill Clinton's and George W. Bush's, and you can, if you're clever and you have the right computer program, you can fuse them together and then you can separate them. And the Clinton neuron would only fire when the subject saw the Clinton face appearing from the morph. Okay. So that's one. The second piece of hard evidence is that uh, when you're thinking of the subject, if that patient whose slide I showed you, the Jennifer Aniston patient, if he was told to think of Jennifer Aniston, then that neuron, which might have been silent, would start firing. And when his attention was diverted elsewhere to another image, it would stop. So there's a tight linkage between the firing and what you are actually consciously doing, seeing. Now, another sort of experiment, which again is hard evidence, is that instead of showing the image for a second, you can start off with a very, very brief showing, 33 milliseconds. Anything shorter than that um, the cell doesn't fire, and the subject is just a of a flash, but can't make out what it's actually showing. But in one subject, at 33 milliseconds, they recognized the subject, who, the actress Whoopi Goldberg, and the cell started firing. The Goldberg cell started firing. So there's a tight linkage. So this is really good evidence. You know, we're recording from neurons in human brains and looking at what is driving the activity. All right. Now, those of you who like electricity and computers and so on um, may have come up with a question. How on earth is the hippocampus able to identify an image in a fraction of a second. You saw how much activity was going on in the hippocampus. There were thousands of other neurons firing at the same time. How on earth can it extract information about one image? And I, 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 couldn't, uh, I just couldn't tackle that at all, actually. Um, and it can probably do it in 100 milliseconds. I'm sure as psychologists, you all know the backward masking experiment, that if you give two different stimuli and they're separate sufficiently in time, you see them as green and red. But if you flash the green too, too soon after the red, instead of seeing green and red, you see yellow. And that means that the brain was holding, as it were, the red memory at a time that it receiving, was receiving the green one. So although we have no sense of interruption, the brain is actually, the sensory systems are working in chunks of time. So how does the hippocampus in actually 100 milliseconds or less um, recognize something? And I think the way it does it is by averaging. <coughs> 
Those of you who are into electrophysiology will know that very small signals can be detected if you keep on repeating the signal. This is what George Dawson did. This is his electromechanical averager that he invented in London, England. And this is how effective it was. Um, this is recordings of touch potentials recorded from an electrode on the scalp. Um, many such recordings here. And it just looks a jumble. You can't make out any response at all. But if you average them, you get a nice, clear potential like that. This is just a calibration pulse showing the same thing. Well, the hippocampus doesn't have the luxury of time. It can't go on having the stimulus repeated, as in Dawson's averager. But nevertheless, it can average. Because when we talk about a Jennifer Aniston neuron, we're not talking about a single Jennifer Aniston neuron in that hippocampus. We're talking about one of perhaps 20,000 Jennifer Aniston neurons. And the improvement in the signal-to-noise ratio is proportional to the square root of the number of observations. So if you have 20,000 and you take the square root of that, I think it comes to 140 or so, and then multiply that by the number of impulses uh, that the cell fires, you have a signal-to-noise ratio up in the hundreds. And that's presumably how the hippocampus can do it. OK. So I'm finishing now. We've been talking about the hippocampus, but you remember right at the start, I showed you the attendees at that symposium in the Laurentians, and I mentioned Magoon and Maruzzi, that they had discovered the reticular activating system. Well, in talking about the hippocampus, we cannot miss out the reticular formation, because you need the reticular activating system to awaken the cortex. But then to be fully conscious, you have to have memory, you have to have knowledge of yourself. And that's where the hippocampus comes in. So it's really a two-stage process. All right. Um, I would understand if you had some reservations. Um, you know, this is a big thing. But I would put to you that the best evidence we have now about the generation of consciousness in a brain is from the hippocampus and working memory. Now, despite what I've said, every year there's a big symposium on consciousness, which is held in Italy at Teomina. And I looked at the program for the last symposium, and there were 200 presentations and not one of them was about concept cells. It really is quite extraordinary. However, I do have some support, or we have mutual support, because at the same time that my book came out, uh, Andrew Batson, who's a very eminent neurologist and psychologist at Harvard, published a long paper in which he is really saying the same thing that consciousness is working memory. His approach was quite different. It was through experimental psychology. And then finally, there is the book. Don't buy copies from me, but do buy them for yourselves and for Oxford University Press. Thank you very much for hearing me. That's an ace question. It's very difficult to define consciousness. Um, as you know, there are something like 30 different definitions. I think the most basic one is awareness of self.
would you, I guess, respond to someone suggesting that um, memory facilitates only the uh, conscious continuity rather than consciousness itself? Your perceived continuity of that um, well, our consciousness is a continuous process. I, I'm not sure that I uh, really understand your question, and it's a failure on my part. Um, um, my suggestion is that um, looking at you, looking at the audience, listening to you, um, all of this is going through my hippocampus. Um, because this has been an emotional occasion for me, some of it is going to be remembered. <laughs> but usually, 99% of what we do in the course of the day is not remembered. And it may very well be that the amygdala is very important for that extra step of cementing the memory, as it were. Um, again, a very good question. Yes. Well, you know, I think this is exactly what happens when we are dreaming. You know, there we are fast asleep in the early hours of the morning, and an image comes into, we'll call it the mind. That image can only have come from the hippocampus. So, uh, so far as we know, there is no other image storage but the hippocampus. So the hippocampal cells fire, and for some reason, up comes an image. And then there will be another image to follow. There will be a sequence developing. And not only that, um, but there will be a narrative, there will be an accompaniment, there will be sound. Not only that, but you start getting emotions. You're bound up in the dream. You can become frightened or you, you can become happy. It can make such an impression on you that when you wake, you've remembered the dream. But the point is, it almost certainly must start with spontaneous firing of hippocampal cells. And everything that follows started with the hippocampus. So then you would expect that they could fire without conscious awareness if, for example, the um, level of activation, or, or rather the uh, duration, would be too short. But if you were to have them do something where they would be asked uh, something more basic, for example, like if there were two flash images, one of which was just white noise, and the other was Jennifer Aniston. Um, uh, well, I think one has to go back to neurophysiology. If, um, despite whatever is presented, um, there's a concept cell for Jennifer Aniston which is firing away, then the subject is going to consciously uh, have the image of Jennifer Ani Aniston. 
despite the white flesh as well. But this is theory, um, you know, this is an interesting experiment to do. And um, uh, I could, I'm actually in touch with uh, Dr. Quiroga in the University of Barcelona, so I can sound him out about this. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. 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 And I think that is the case. You know. So these experiments have all been done, I presume, under local anesthesia, but not general. Sorry. These experiments have been done under local, but not general anesthesia. Yes. No. Um, the problem is that the anaesthetic would knock out the general arousal system. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so, okay, so, so in your model, the, uh, the reticular activating system is critical as well as the hippocampus. Yeah. The hippocampus provides, um, provides consciousness, but you still have to actually get past the, the threshold. Yes. There's no way to... Okay. Yeah, that would be I would have thought not, no. Yeah. 